Hello, everybody. Welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed, the live television edition. It is June 5th. 2013, and uh, whether you're watching on uh, IPMNation.com live or on MPTS, if you're watching on MPTS, this is probably relatively new to you, uh, but uh, this is our second week doing the show here at MPTS. Uh, this is not a new program. Uh, we were doing it for about a year over at QC News, which leads into what I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, the, uh, the television edition was at QCE, which is, of course, owned by the powerful and attractive Glenn R.J. Willett, and we did recently move the show here. Uh, we do continue to um, share a lot of programming, ipmnation.com and QCE. But uh, regardless of where you're watching us, whether you're watching us live or watching us later, thanks for joining us. Uh, feel free to call in the number on your screen if you are watching us live. Also, you can go to uh, ipmnation.com slash mcutv. Uh, you may already be there if you're watching online, but uh, we do have a chat room there, too, which I will try to remember to keep an eye on if anyone wants to chat. If you're too shy to call in, you can also text 603-344-6491. So several ways. And come to think of it, I'll open the uh, Facebook, too. If you haven't liked us yet, go to uh, Facebook, Matt Connerton Unleashed, the uh, Facebook page. Give us a like, and we will remind you and pester you as to when the show is on and what we'll be talking about, etc. So, uh, also with me is, of course, Little Mel. Hello. She is our marketing minion at IPMNation.com. I am. And uh, she uh, does a lot of the booking for our shows, including this one, as far as guests and so forth. And she's the host of No Boundaries. I am. Monday nights at 10.30 p.m. Eastern on IPMNation.com. That is uh, radio only. So, And um, one of the most popular shows on the station. And we don't have a guest this week. It's just Mel and I, but I do want to mention it. I'll mention too again at the end of the show. Next week, I'm very excited, Dr. Kevin Ross Emery will be here with us live in the studio. And Dr. Kevin has done a lot of work in the area of ADD and ADHD. Um, he's a, you may have seen him on Norman Friends. He's been a frequent guest on there, but he's now living in Arizona. But he's going to be back next week to visit. So he's going to be on both this program and on Norman Friends next week, Dr. Kevin Ross Emery. Uh, he's also a, sort of an extended member of the IPM Nation family. He, was, uh, he hosted uh, Out of the Box with Dr. Kevin. Oh, I'm sorry, Outside the Box with Dr. Kevin, and then later Out of the Closet uh, with Dr. Kevin, which is not about what it sounds like it is. Um, <laughs> but uh, both great shows, and all the shows are archived on IPMNation.com, so you can check those out anytime. So... Uh, since we don't have a guest, I kind of have a, a grab bag of things in front of me that uh, you know the hour goes quick, so we'll we'll see what uh, we'll see what we get to. But I do need to address something. I mentioned QCE News, and I mentioned Glenn R. J. Willett. On our way here today, it was requested of me by Glenn R. J. Willett, uh, rather loudly and vociferously, that I clarify something that happened last week here on the show. Last week, on, on this program, for the very first edition of the show here at MPTS, uh, we had a caller. And Mel, you were here. I was, yeah. You remember, we had a, we had a call from uh, Glenn R.J. Willett, mm -hmm. yep. which surprised me because we had just talked to him yeah, down the hall. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. And, uh, yeah. you know, he was in the green room. He's not here this week. I was hoping he'd be here this week so I can invite him in. So he was down the hall. And uh, so then we come in, we sit down, we start the show, and uh, we, our first call, first call of the show. And uh, it, we had a couple of guests, too. We had uh, John Heichel and uh, Patrick Arnold, who are both here as well. And, uh, but the phone rings, and I, I said, uh, all right, our first call here at the, the, new, uh, the new studio for the show. And it was Glenn R.J. Willett. And then it got weird because... He was using some language that was a little salty by, by Glenn's standards, but, but you know, well, I guess it depends on the time of day. But anyway, so it, it was a little surprising some of the things he was saying and talking about, and, and uh, he did refer to me as sugar butt, which I was a little taken aback that he'd call me that on the air. I thought that was his pet name just for me in private, but, you know. But uh, so, so the call goes on, and, and we're talking to him, and then all of a sudden... Uh, Patrick Arnold says, hey, uh, he's quite the ventriloquist because uh, I see him right there. So he was uh, on the other side. You can't see it here in the studio, but in the other room, in the control room, there's glass separating the two rooms so that 
you know, they can see what's going on in here and can't really see what's going on out there. There's a kind of a glare. Um, but Patrick, from where he was sitting, was able to see him. And, and Gwen was out there, apparently waving his arms and, and so forth. So at this point, and I didn't see Glenn talking on a phone, but we still had Glenn on the phone. So I was like, well, this is weird. I thought maybe Glenn had cloned himself. I mean, they cloned a sheep uh, years ago. Was it uh, Dolly? Dolly, yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. That's right. So I thought maybe they had cloned Glenn R.J. Willette. I thought we had multiple Glenn R.J. Willettes. Can you imagine? So I was confused. Next thing I know, Glenn R.J. Willette, or at least the man who claims to be Glenn R.J. Willette, perhaps he was wearing a mask, but he comes running in and begins yelling at the phone and says uh, something about Mr. Imposter, I'm the real Glenn R.J. Willette, and then walks away, storms off, and said something about family programming. This is family programming. I don't know whose family watches me, but... Um, and then he stormed off. So then... I was very confused. I think we were all very... I, I was really confused. Very confused. Yeah. It, it was very, very confusing. Because obviously, obviously we all thought it was the real Glenn R.J. Willette on the phone. I mean, what reasonable person wouldn't have believed that that was, in fact, the Glenn R.J. Willette calling? I just, when he stormed in here, I, just, I didn't know what to believe. I know. My whole world just came undone, and yeah. I was so confused. Yeah, it was like uh, an alternate universe or something. I still was, have nightmares over it, it now. It was, it was it's, weird. It's, it yeah. freaked me out. It was like some kind of sci-fi thing, right? Well, it turns out, and this is going to be a big surprise, because I spoke with Glenn earlier. And by I spoke with him, I really mean uh, he yelled and I listened uh, for as long as I could. And then I just kind of hung up. I, I think we ended the conversation with me saying, anything else? And then him saying no. And then I hung up. Um, that's kind of how that went. Uh, apparently, that was not, in fact, Glenn R.J. Willette on the phone. What? No. It, it no, was an no, imposter. I, I, uh, it was someone horsing around. It was someone engaging in some sort of tomfoolery. Are you sure? According to Glenn R.J. Willett, when he was... And I, I, I heard him loud and clear because he was yelling at me. Yeah. He was yelling at me. I could actually hear him. I was, yes, you yeah, could hear I was him. sitting yes. next to him. I could hear him. I didn't have the speakerphone on. He was yelling at me uh, that it was, in fact, not him. And he asked me to inform the audience that that was not, in fact, Glenn R.J. Willett. To which I said, Glenn... Come on. I'm not that gullible. It had to be you. You just figured out some way to be in two places at once. Because he's a smart man. But, uh, but no, apparently it was, in fact, an imposter. And he asked me to make sure that you, the viewing audience at home, know that that was not the real Glenn R.J. Willette. So I just found this out earlier today. I received a Facebook message from him today saying, Matt, please call me. I received one, too, yes. saying, please call Matt. Yes. Yep. Yes, asking me to call Glenn. And, uh, and I did, and, and, and that's when he told me. So. Well, thank God you straightened that out. Yes, yes. I don't know if you can hear the, the voice of, that's, uh, that's God uh, talking to us. Uh, he says, uh, thank God I straightened that out. Wait, if he's God and he said, thank God. Wow, that's weird. That's trippy, yeah. too. It's like there's two gods. It's like there was two Glenn R.J. Willets, and now there's two gods. I don't know what to believe anymore. I know, right? It's crazy. So I hope everyone at home uh, fully understands that that was, in fact, not Glenn R.J. Willett on the phone. Now, now that we've cleared that up, and hopefully Glenn, because apparently Glenn was a bit upset with me, hence the yelling. Um, I had sensed over the past week, actually, that he was not uh, particularly uh, enamored of me uh, at the moment. Uh, well, in some ways, I'm sure he still is, but uh, kind of. But uh, I, I can't reciprocate any of that. But regardless, um, yeah, I got the sense that he was upset about something. You know, uh, Sunday night, I brought him food. I brought him a hamburger. I heard. That was very nice of you. I did, because I sensed that he was upset with me about something. So Sunday nights, we do a show. Uh, V.E. is the initial. I can't say the, uh, the, the full name is not appropriate for 2 o'clock in the afternoon uh, on, on this uh in this venue, but, uh, but Sunday nights we do a show on IPMNation.com called VE, and we do it from the QC News studio, and uh, because I, I felt that Glenn was upset with me, I decided to bring him food, kind of a peace offering. He said he wasn't hungry, but he would save it for later, 
and he did uh, take it with him when we left. Um, so I, you know, I, I tried to make peace, not not fully realizing that there had been some sort of skullduggery occurring. Uh, but now that I know, now that I know what he was really upset about, I understand. I understand. If someone impersonated me, boy, I'll tell you what. If someone tried to make fun of me, have some fun at my expense, have a laugh doing an impression of me. Ooh, boy! I actually, I'd probably think it was really funny. Huh? Yeah. I guess yeah. I'm just weird. I guess I have a sense of humor. I guess I don't take myself that seriously. But you know, maybe I don't know. I mean, I'm just a different breed of cat, I guess. He was he was quite upset. So anyway, so Glenn, I hope you eventually ate your hamburger that I brought you to you know as a peace offering, and I, I hope that you accept my very sincere apology. I am deeply sorry for what happened. Oh, by the way, uh, we put up a poll at ipmnation.com uh, slash MCU TV. Uh, this is a poll that we put up last week. Oh, there it is. Uh, let's look at some stats here. Now, the poll question was, and I'm pr- probably going to start doing this every week as a, uh, you know, some uh, viewer participation here. Uh, last week's poll question was, does Matt O. Glenn R.J. Willette an apology for what happened on the 529 MCU TV edition. And here are the results. You, the public, then voted. And if you didn't vote, shame on you. I hope you vote in the next one. Uh, There were three options. No, yes, and yes, but with sarcasm. Uh, No received 20% of the vote. Yes received 13% of the vote. And... 67%, 67%, an overwhelming 67% of the vote went to yes, but with sarcasm. So our first ever poll question here at ipmnation.com slash MCU TV. So anyway, that was our poll. But again, I just want to reiterate, and this has nothing to do with the poll. This has nothing to do with the, the results of the poll. This is a completely separate thing. I just happen to be mentioning it after the poll that I am so Sorry. I, you know, the last thing I ever want to do is poke fun at anybody or have fun at somebody else's expense or make a joke that someone might not like or, you know, engage in something called humor. I would never do that. So I, I really, I mean, I just, I, I don't, I don't even have the words to express how, how deeply sorry. I mean, I, I, I haven't been able to sleep. I haven't been able to eat. I'm just so... I'm just... Matt, I commend you. This takes a lot of courage on your part. Good, you know, good I, for I you. Just, I, I try so hard, and I just... I know, I, I know. I, you know, I, you I know. just... I don't know what... I need to take a break, Matt. Oh, God is asking me if I... No, no, I'll be okay. I, I don't need a break. I just... I, this, is just this is a very emotional time for me. I, you're very courageous, Matt. I know. You're I, very, I just... I don't, I don't want to... I don't want to hurt anybody. I, know. I just, you know... Oh. I, 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 I thought it was really him calling. I, I, I just, I, I, everybody thought it was him calling. I, I, I had know. no idea. Well, I, I, how how I mean, do Eddie, people know? What, what, what reasonable person would not have believed that that was... I mean, it was a perfect impression. Exactly. I, oh, it just really... I thought it was him. He called me sugar butt and everything. Who else calls me that? I mean, really. Oh, I don't know. I just... So anyway, I, I am sorry. Um, and while I'm at it, I should probably apologize to Ginger... Because she was clearly upset with me. Yes, Mr. Connerton. Yes. Ginger was on, uh, uh, prior to this show, uh, Ginger Fair, host of, uh, uh, what, what is it called now? Leveling Your Leveling Playing Field? Your playing field. Le- leveling, leveling the Playing Field? Your. It is your, okay. Leveling Your Playing Field. Uh, and um, I guess uh, she mentioned me at the beginning of the show, and uh, as we were... Uh, I'm, I'm now sitting where she was, and, and uh, as she relinquished her chair, you know, I said, hello, Ginger. And I tried to be cheerful. I think I was cheerful. Yeah, Wasn't I cheerful? Yeah, you were very cheerful. I think I was yeah. very cheerful. I said, hello, Ginger. And, uh, and she said, Mr. Connerton. And that's all she said. You know, and then, and, and because she seemed frosty, uh, I did not uh, then do what I, because my next thing was going to be, I was going to say, Ginger, give me a hug. <laughs> That's the next thing I was going to do, right? Is, come on, give, just, just give me a hug, you know? You know, hug it out, you know? But uh, I, I have a feeling... She wouldn't have reciprocated. No, no, no. So, 
And, and if Glenn were here, I was hoping Glenn was going to be here today. So I was going to say, Glenn, give me a hug. It would have been a big hug fest. Yeah, and it would have been, I mean, I know, you know, Glenn, he kind of, you know, but it would have been a, I would have made sure it was a manly hug. Yeah. You know, because I want him to get the wrong idea. Yeah, it would have been the whole, you know, hitting on the back thing, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's how you know it's manly. It's like I'm hugging you, but I'm hitting you at the same time, so it's manly. I don't even know, a manly, a manly embrace with Glenn R.J. Willette. That would be a good name for his uh, his show. Instead of Willette at large, it should be a manly embrace nice. with Glenn R.J. Willette. That's a good name. Yes, yes. I like that. Yes. The show could end and begin every week when he has a guest, which he doesn't always, but, you know, with a good manly embrace. Yeah. He could have Ginger on. They could have a manly embrace together. I bet Ginger gives good manly embraces. I bet she gives a good yeah. manly embrace. She does. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so, oh, I'm sorry to both of them. Um, now, I, I will say this in all seriousness. I, I do think that sometimes people do take themselves a bit too seriously. Mm-hmm. And... I, I, I did legitimately mean it when I said, if someone did that to me, I would think it was funny. But when I pick on someone like Glenn, or like Ginger for that matter, it's not done with any sort of malice at all. It, quite the opposite. This is the God's honest truth. I love Glenn. I think Glenn is an awesome person. I've known him for years. Uh, he does a lot for the community. He loves Manchester probably more than anybody I know. He's a great guy. Glenn, Glenn is truly a great guy, and I do mean that very sincerely. But He's such a unique, eccentric character. You know, I can't help but... I mean, Norm and I do it a lot, too. We, we poke fun at him. But it's done with love. It really is. It's done with affection. It's not done with any kind of malice. Because the truth of the matter is this. If I didn't like Glenn or if I thought he was a buffoon or whatever... You wouldn't say anything. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't say anything. I would just ignore him. Mm-hmm. You know? Because that's what I do to people I don't like. If I don't like somebody, I'll just ignore him. Uh, why give them publicity? You know? That's what you did. By talking about QC News, exactly. you gave him publicity. Exactly. Now, I don't know about the person who called him, personating him. He may have had ill intentions. I don't know. But, uh, you know, who knows? Because I have no idea who that was. Yeah, I have no idea. I have no idea who that was. No. I mean, Dan does a good impression of Glenn. But I have no idea who that was on the phone last week. I have no idea. That's why I thought, it, you know, like I said, I thought it was him. But, uh, but no, I mean, it's, you know, uh, I, I, think, um, I think people need to lighten up a little bit. I agree. And Glenn told me when he was yelling at me that this is not a comedy show. Um, it's not a comedy show officially. I don't label it as such. But again, I do occasionally engage in things like humor or uh, satire. <laughs> you know, I mean, why not? We've got to fill an hour. Why not? Right, right. Plus, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of a sarcastic guy. I mean, anyone who's seen me on Norman Friends or Rock, Paper, and Grenades knows that. But, uh, but there is no ill intent, and I, I, do, wish, uh, I do wish that both uh, Glenn and Ginger understood that. I tease because I love. Not in that kind of way, Glenn. Don't get any ideas. That was very moving. Thank you. It's extremely warm in here today. It is extremely warm in here. Um, yeah, probably uh, because, you know, Ginger was here and... and her, her anger and, and, and rage yeah. just uh, fills the room. Well, I also imagine with um, I also imagine with all your chest hair, you must get pretty warm all the time because it's like is it like wearing like a giant sweater all the time? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Pretty much, right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, and uh, maybe you can you can tell, I'm I'm extremely hairy. Uh, I'm actually not allowed at the beach. I've been uh, I've been banned. It's not. I, I should clarify. It's not that I'm not allowed. I just I cannot remove my shirt. If I go into the water, the, uh, you know, the lifeguards, they get on the, you know, get out of the water, there's hair in the water. You know what I mean? Yep. So, uh, new children get caught in it if they're swimming. Coast Guard shows up. Coast Guard shows up, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. So, um, and I understand, it's all for public safety. I have no, uh, no, no uh, Ill, Ill will toward uh, OSHA for declaring that I can't be in the water. I didn't even know they... Uh, dealt with beaches. Um, so we have, a, 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 like I said, a grab bag of things that we can talk about. So I'm just going to pick something. Um, by the way, for those who don't know, if you're new to the show, the reason it's called Unleashed is because I um, sometimes wear a dog collar and uh, 
No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. Glenn said this is family programming. I'm just kidding. No, uh, it's called Unleashed because on the show, I pretty much just say what I think and uh, people can like it or not, But uh, which is kind of the idea of doing a show like this anyway. But um, I, I, something I'm, I'm really upset about that I've never talked about on this or the radio edition of the show is, um, and I'm only going to spend a couple minutes on this and then we'll get in more in depth on something else, but um, there's been an ongoing story in the news. Actually, let me see if I can pull something up about, uh, and this isn't anything new, but it's starting to get more attention. Uh, Military families having their homes foreclosed on. Have you seen any of this? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Um, I know you're a big fan of Rachel, and she's talked about this, yep. Rachel Maddow on MSNBC. Yep. Um, there's, there's been a uh, – I'll see if I can pull up the latest uh, bit of news on this, but you might see me come unleashed about this. Basically what happens is, you know, obviously the foreclosure problem has been huge in this country, and, and a huge part of what seemed to trigger the current economic malaise – I mean, we are in a – we're in a recovery – uh, which seems to be picking up steam. There has been some good economic data uh, lately. But, uh, but the recovery has been sluggish. It's been a jobless recovery in, in a lot of uh, states. We're very fortunate here in New Hampshire in that even in both good times and bad, we tend to have one of the lowest unemployment rates of any state in the country. But uh, generally, it's been a jobless recovery. It's been very tough. And, of course, the housing market, the collapse of the housing market in the minds of a lot of people, a lot of economists – seems to be a, a big part of what triggered that. And therefore, and a lot of economists have said many times that until the housing market fully bottoms out and begins to come back in a strong way, in a big way, then we will not enter a full and robust recovery. But a lot of people have had their homes foreclosed on. Uh, you probably know someone who has had his or her home or, or a family who, who have had their home foreclosed on. Um, it, it's just been awful. I certainly know people who've had their homes foreclosed on, uh, people who, you know, entered into these mortgages, entered into these situations with every intention of paying on time, paying every month, keeping up to date, and something goes wrong, and all it takes is, you know, one, one brick out of the wall, and then everything starts to fall apart in someone's life, economically, or in, in a family's, um, the economy of, of a family's household, you know, somebody gets laid off, or medical bills. You know, that's the number one cause of bankruptcy in this country is, is medical bills that someone can't pay, and then they end up having to file for bankruptcy because they can't pay their bills. Um, but a lot of people have lost their homes, and there's been a lot of attention paid lately, but not enough attention paid to this, to military families who are losing their home because, you know, mom or dad of the household has to go to Iraq or Afghanistan or somewhere else that we probably shouldn't have gone into to begin with, um, you know, to fight these uh, these crap wars that we never should have entered into to begin with. And then they come home to find that the bank has taken their homes away. Now, the, the whole foreclosure thing is a mess to begin with because a lot of people, I haven't been through it, I've never owned my own home, but I know a lot of people who, it gets very confusing very quickly because someone is coming to foreclose on their home and it's not, as far as they know, it's not even the bank that holds their mortgage or their mortgage has been sold from one bank to another bank to another bank. And it gets to a point where no one is even 100% sure legally who owns the mortgage, which sounds crazy, but this is what happens. Debt is constantly being sold and resold. Mortgages get handed around, passed around from bank to bank. And suddenly someone who doesn't even think, they might not even realize they were in any trouble. They might have been paying monthly their mortgage payments to a bank, and it turns out it's some other bank who now legally owns or claims to legally own the mortgage on their home. But the first bank who's been getting the payments, they're not saying anything like, stop paying us, you need to pay somebody else, because that would never happen, right? This is what... So, so, so that's that's bad enough. Okay, my heart goes out to anyone who's had to deal with that. My parents did. Really? Yeah. 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 My when I was younger, my parents had to file for bankruptcy, and they lost the um, house that I lived in. Really? Yep. 
And and why was why why was the uh, I mean I don't know how much you want to say about it, but uh, the 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 bankruptcy filing what precipitated that was it a medical um, bill thing or I honestly don't know because I was yeah. like I was really really young when it happened. I just remember them my mother like telling me about it. Um, I think it was just they kind of fell on hard times and yeah. Um, I know my dad got fired from where he was working at one point, so it might have had something to do with that. Yeah. Um. But yeah, like I remember, you know, we had to move and everything. And I, uh, at the time, I didn't know why because I was like six years old. So sure. obviously, they didn't they didn't tell me. But then I found out after. And what you were saying about you know how it goes from like bank to bank to bank. Mm-hmm. That's basically how it is with collection agencies too. Like you have a bill that you owe for like a store or whatever, and it goes to this collection agency, but they only keep it for a certain amount of time. So by the time you get around to pay, wanting to pay it, you have no idea who to contact right. because you have no idea who has it. Right, and I think that's by design. Mm-hmm. They want you to be confused <laughs> because ultimately it's to their advantage. Um, here's oh, let me let me read this to you quickly. This is from DealBook.NewYorkTimes.com. Uh, This article is, uh, Jessica Silver wrote this. It says, banks find more wrongful foreclosures among military members. I'll read a little bit of this to you. And then I'm going to um, uh, tell you, aside from the obvious, why this makes me so incredibly angry. Uh, The nation's biggest banks wrongfully foreclosed on more than 700 military members during the housing crisis and seized homes from roughly two dozen other borrowers who were, current on their, who were current on their mortgage payments, findings that eclipse earlier estimates of the improper evictions. Bank of America, who I hate. Oh, me too. Yeah, a lot of people do. Citicorp, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Wells Fargo uncovered the foreclosures while analyzing mortgages as part of a multi-million dollar settlement deal with federal authorities, according to the people who direct, uh, with direct knowledge of the findings. In January, regulars ordered the banks to identify military members and other borrowers who were evicted in violation of federal law. Um, I don't need to read the rest of it. It's obvious what, what's wrong with this. Um, when discussing economic issues, there are many different theories. There, there's a lot of different economic theories. And economics is theory. It's not an exact science, uh, regardless of whatever politician tries to tell you that their party knows exactly how the economy works and the other party has no idea. By the way, as a side note, uh, if you want to know about the economy, and I'm not an economist, I'm no expert, but if you want to know about the economy, um, I would suggest reading things that have been written by economists, uh, finding things online uh, that economists have written. Or, you mean actual experts? Or, yeah, actual experts, who people who wow. actually know something about e- economics. That's, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I understand that uh, partisan ideological groupthink, which I may get to later, uh, that dictates that you have to go along with whatever yep. you heard of your party. One hundred percent. And if right. you disagree a little bit, then obviously you know you're not part of that party. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, but. I always figure, you know, that, that's why, for example, uh, Republicans don't believe in climate change because their party tells them it's not real yep. and that science is some sort of sorcery. You know, it's, there's no mention of it in the, in the magic book. So, you know, if God wouldn't tell us about it, it can't be real. Um, not, not all of them believe that, but a lot of them do. <laughs> um, anyway, um, when it comes to economic issues, um, look, I'm a free market capitalist. I am. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, For those who don't know my political history, I used to be a Democrat, and then I became an independent. Uh, And part of why I became an independent was the Democratic Party began to frustrate me in terms of, while I agree with Democrats largely on social issues, like women's reproductive rights and gay marriage and things like that, um, (laughs) on economic issues, uh, specifically issues dealing with small business, I feel that Democrats make it much too difficult for small business to function and to thrive. Um, and so I had to stop being a Democrat largely for that. There are some other reasons, too. There are, I mean, I'm kind of, a, I consider myself to be a centrist. I don't fit into either party, but I probably do on balance lean more left than right if you add it all up. But I am a free market capitalist, but I believe, like I think most people believe, in 
fair market capitalism. In other words, there should be some sort of honesty in, in capitalism. It should not be legal for someone to make money, make money on you, make money at your expense by means of fraud or any other kind of malfeasance. It, it should be fair. Free market capitalism should also be fair market capitalism. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people, if you ask them, well, is it fair for military families to be having their, their homes foreclosed on unlawfully? Well, obviously, the obvious answer is, of course not. But we've the, the political conversation in this country between the two parties has become so polarized and so dumbed down, frankly, in this soundbite culture that we live in, that if you raise these issues... Look, I have, I have plenty of things to pick on, by the way. If you're new to the show, let me just tell you, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, I have plenty of things to pick on about both parties. Both parties infuriate and repulse me in different ways. So I don't want you to get the idea that, you know, I'm really just some liberal who's sitting here to bash Republicans, because that's not why I'm here. But I will tell you, but I will, I'm very critical of Republicans on this. The way the political conversation has gone in this country, we have come to a point where if you disagree with just this sort of absolutely 100% open, free market, wild west sort of anything goes capitalism, if you disagree with it or question it at all, you immediately have some Republicans, not all, but many Republicans will immediately start shouting at you, oh, class warfare, you're engaging in class warfare. How dare you stick up for the little guy? That means you hate rich people. You know? Uh, how dare you uh, even bother to notice that the income disparity in this country continues to grow and to grow and to grow, which is true. If you look at a chart or a graph, you will see income disparity continues to grow. When I was younger, and I would hear someone say, well, you know, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, I used to think it was just something someone said uh, when they don't know what else to say and they want to sound like, they, like they're smart. Well, you know, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. What are you going to do? Uh, it's actually true, it turns out. If you look at actual economic data, you know, as Bill O'Reilly likes to say, facts are stubborn things. It is true. And more and more of the wealth in this country is concentrated at the top, and the middle class is disappearing, and it's just there. The, the, the devil is in the details, so to speak. Um, but unfortunately, there is a very large faction on the right that just doesn't want to hear it. And if you say anything about this, any, any, anything at all that questions anything about capitalism, they, they call you a commie, they assume you're a socialist, and they say that you're engaging in class warfare and that you should be ashamed of yourself because you obviously hate people for being rich and successful. Now, I am a free market capitalist, but I'm also a fair market capitalist. And I don't want a version of capitalism. I, look, I believe in competition. I believe in all that. I really do. But I don't think we necessarily need to have a version of capitalism that very deliberately crushes people underneath it. And look... If I understand, if you don't want any, if you really believe that capitalism should be completely unregulated, that nothing should be regulated, and that government only wants to destroy business, and government hates capitalists, and so everything should be completely unregulated. If you really believe that, fine. Go on believing that. But when I look at this foreclosure thing, I have a question. Can we at least agree on this much? Even if you're the ultimate libertarian when it comes to capitalism and you really believe anything goes and the rich can do whatever they want and if you fall between the cracks, oh well, screw you. It just means you're a bad American because that's what a lot of these people think. If you apply for government services or whatever, you're just a drain on the system and you're a bad American. Mm. Um, which is why uh, Republicans who collect unemployment always make me laugh. A little bit of irony there. But... Um, can we at least agree on this much? Even if you really want this anything-goes version of capitalism, can we 
maybe make this one tiny little compromise. And even if you disagree with everything I've said, and you really want that anything goes capitalism, I just, I have one thing to ask you, just one tiny bit of compromise. Can we at least have a version of capitalism that somehow, somehow manages to not spit directly in the faces of the people that we send off to fight and die in these BS wars? Is that asking too much? Can we have a version of capitalism that doesn't go out of its way to make sure that our military members and our military families, to make sure that they really understand that they really get the point, that we really don't appreciate anything they do for us? Why is it so important to have a version of capitalism that is so just completely unfettered that we have to just crush military families with it? Is that really necessary? Can we at least agree on that? We have a call. Hi, welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed. Who's this? I'm Matt, I'm a co-host over another show. Hello? 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 Norm, are you there? Yeah. Hey, what's this I hear you and uh, um, Glenn are going to get a divorce now? Well, I I don't think we're actually getting a divorce because uh, we're, we're not actually married. Um, but, uh, but he is, uh, did, did, did you see why he's, he's upset with me? Did you happen to see last week's show? Yeah, I did, but I couldn't, I still think that was him, you know, to try to impersonate, you know what I mean? Well, that's what I thought too. I mean, we were all fooled. I mean, it clearly, as you know, Norm, I mean, it, it sounded yeah. exactly like him. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, Matt, my testimony to you is, thank you for the hypnosis. I have not had... One episode that's uh, under the uh, hypnosis. Excellent. Congratulations, Norm. That's yeah. awesome. And I want to talk to you about uh, when we at work, we're going to be discussing this uh, problem when you and Glenn end the divorce. I just thought I'll let you know. Okay. All right. I mean, divorce, obviously, you mean uh, figuratively, but... Uh, right, right. The separation. Yes, yes. Well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to stop being his friend or, or stop working with him. I just, um, really, at this point, I just want him to forgive me because I'm, as you know, Norman. I, I, I forgive it. It wasn't your fault. Well, well, I, I know. That's what I thought. I mean, uh, who wouldn't have been fooled by that amazing impression that someone did last I, week? I, I really, it was very articulated, very well. Yes, yes. I mean, it was spot on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll see you All right, Norm. I'll see you then. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. That was, of course, Norm from Norm and Friends. Uh, I'm Norm's co-host on that show from 4 to 6 today on MPTS and, of course, IPMNation.com if you're watching online. Um, but, yeah, I, hopefully we can all at least agree on that, that we should have some version of capitalism because I'll tell you what. Um, I, I have a, a, just a very deep love and abiding respect for our military. I truly do. Um, my dad was in the Navy, and I'm, I'm very proud to have a, a veteran uh, for a father. Very proud of my dad in, in general. He's, he's a, an amazing guy. Um, and our foreign policy troubles me deeply because um, I don't believe we ever, we never should have invaded Iraq. We never should have uh, gone into Afghanistan or the Afghanistan thing, I can almost understand, you know, going in, making a statement, going in right after 9-11, hurting some people just to remind everybody what we can do and then leaving. could almost justify that. Um, even though uh, if you really wanted to invade uh, a country that you could tie to what happened in 9-11, we would have had to invade Saudi Arabia, really. But you can't uh, do that. You know, the Wahhabi tribe in Saudi Arabia, that's where um, those guys, that's where Osama bin Laden recruited those guys from. The Wahhabi tribe, yeah, that's in Saudi Arabia. It's not in Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, just want to clarify that for the apologists who uh, continue to defend the Bush administration. Not that there's many of you left. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, th these, these people, I just, I, I so deeply respect them because... The, the military, not the Bush administration, because they, they truly believe 
that they're defending our country. And it breaks my heart. You know, I, this, is a, this is a hard thing to articulate. It Obviously, my heart breaks for any family who has lost someone overseas in any war. Um, and that's that's a, a terrible thing, and I don't I don't know what it's like to have to deal with that. I don't um, I haven't I haven't lost anyone that way, but um, my family has really yeah. my um bo- my both my grandfathers fought in World War II, and my uncles did, and both of them died oh, no during the war. Um, yeah. One of them was uh, he was shot down in a plane, and they never found his body. Oh, wow, so really? it's my grandmother's brother and everything. Yeah. Um, if you go to the North End in Boston, they have like signs dedicated them, to them and everything. Yeah, yeah. And I just like if, if someone ever, you know, if my grandfather came back from like World War Two, and they were like, oh, you know, thanks for your service. By the way, you're homeless now. Right. Like. Right. It's hideous. It, it's it's it, it's awful. hideous. Um, and, and, you know, and I, I, I also have tremendous sympathy for our military because I feel like, uh, it's so easy. It's so easy for someone like George W. Bush or Dick Cheney or whoever, or Donald Rumsfeld. It's so easy for them to make these decisions that affect the families of thousands and thousands of people in this country when they decide to uh, to send someone off to war. Well, have um, you seen the um, the interactive like game thing they have at the Bush uh, Presidential Library? Uh, I haven't seen it yet. Um, they talked about it a bit on Rachel Maddow, and like I can't remember exactly, but it was something along the lines of you know you're supposed to be making these decisions on whether or not to send people and. If you chose no, like, take no action, they'd have some, like, military person come on and basically, like, scold you for, like, not sending people over to, like, Iraq or Afghanistan. Right, right. And it's, it's, you'll have to, like, uh, check it out at some point, but the whole thing's, like, ridiculous. Yeah. They're like, are you really sure you want to make this decision? Yeah, because it's all so simple to them. It's like, yes or no. They, to them, they don't, uh, you know, to them it's, it's, uh... It's like they're not they're not people that they're dealing with. They're they're just they're just pawns, pawns in a chess game. Pawns in a chess game. Yep. I mean, I really believe that's how they feel. And my, like I said, my heart breaks for anyone who's lost anyone that way. Um, but my heart breaks even more. Uh, I mean, it's almost too overwhelming to, to imagine what this must be like. My heart breaks even more for anyone who has lost someone in these wars. Um, and then has to deal with the realization that moment that I'm sure inevitably some people have where that light bulb kind of goes off over their heads and they realize that these are wars that we never should have gotten into to begin with. They were purely political, had nothing to do with defending the country, and therefore their son or daughter, sister, brother, whoever, uh, died for nothing. Died because, uh, I don't know, because W felt like he had to make a statement that he could be a commander in chief or whatever it is, whatever sick things go on in these people's heads who make these awful decisions uh, to send your family off to die. Um, anyone who's had that realization, who's who's lost someone, I, I can't even imagine what that must be like. That that must be just beyond awful, and and my my heart breaks for anyone who um, who has to deal with that. Um, I mean, I would prefer that no one have to even think of that, you know. If, <laughs> um, but, and I, and I also get very angry, by the way, because inevitably I'm sure there's someone watching this show thinking that uh, there, there's also a mindset that's very prevalent in this country. Uh, typically, well, among right-wingers, not all of them think this way. I don't want to paint with a broad brush. I'm always scolding other people about that. I, I, I know a lot of people... A lot of right-wing people who now, in hindsight, acknowledge that we have made some terrible mistakes militarily mm-hmm. with our foreign policy. But there are also these right-wingers who, anytime you say anything critical of our foreign policy, they, they call you, uh, they, they say, well, you obviously hate the military. And they, they, they conflate the two. Well, if you don't support our foreign policy, that means you don't support the troops. I can't even tell you how furiously angry I am when I hear someone say that. 
He says, I don't support our foreign policy because I do support our troops. Because I love our troops. And because I have such an incredible, deep abiding respect for them, I don't want to see them used as pawns in some BS political game. And that's what we do. And that's what we've done for decades. Whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's Iraq, you know, Vietnam. I mean, every once in a while, you'll hear some crazy person say, well, you know, if we'd hung in there a little bit longer, we could have gotten it done in Vietnam. I mean, just, just all this crazy, indefensible stuff that some people don't want to acknowledge was a really bad idea. And if you, if you say anything like what I'm saying right now, I mean, I would not be surprised if that phone rings and some idiot calls and says, well, you know, you're obviously not patriotic because you're questioning this and you're questioning that and you obviously hate our military and this and that. I don't like what we do with our foreign policy because I love our military. And I want, when, when our brave men and women sign up for this, I want them to actually be able to do what they signed up for, defending our country. I don't want them to have to fight for oil. I don't want them to have to fight for other geopolitical reasons that have nothing to do with defending our country, with our safety and security. Never, there's so many things that we never should have done, but we send them to do it. And then when they come back, what do we do? They come back, oh, sorry, we foreclosed on your house. So... I can't even tell you how angry I get when somebody tries to tell me that I obviously don't support our troops because I don't support our foreign policy. Uh, it just, it's, it's amazing to me that, that some people just don't get it. You know, I love our troops because I'll tell you, I will freely admit in front of the world I will say this, not on my best day do I have the nerve to put on a uniform and strap on a weapon and go running into a place where people are actively trying to kill me? I don't have it in me to do it. I don't. I like to think if I had to, I would. But you're not going to see me enlisting. I don't. I just don't have it in me to do it. So I... Absolutely, just I have so much respect and admiration for anyone who does have the courage to go and do that. But is it really too much to ask that we not foreclose on their damn home while they're over there doing it? While they're over there being misused as a pawn in these sick foreign policy games our government plays? Is that asking too much? Can we at least let them have a home when they come back? Really? I mean, is it so important that we have this completely unregulated free market economics where anything goes and buyer beware and screw you if you fall behind on something. Oh, well, too bad you weren't rich. Then you wouldn't have any problems. Is that asking too much? I've dealt a lot with like collection agencies and being past due because, you know, I, I was unemployed for a year mm -hmm. and these people, when they call you, when you try to explain to them, you know, listen, I don't have a job. I literally don't have any savings. Well, can you ask somebody? Like, <laughs> is there anyone you can borrow money from? Well, Mitt Romney says you can borrow money from your parents. Yeah, like, you know, you're a family member, and it's, and, oh, well, why don't you have money? And they start asking all these, like, really personal questions about yeah. your life, yeah. and... It's like, why can't you just accept that I've been unemployed for a year, any money I had was used to pay whatever, you know, phone bill or groceries or whatnot. Yeah. And like you said, sorry I'm not rich. Right, right. Let me go get my secret, like, mattress with my money that I'm clearly hiding away and not, you know, giving to you. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, something's got to be done about this foreclosure thing. Um, I just... Uh, you know, and, and it's not getting it's not getting the attention that it should. Uh, everyone's distracted with um, everything else. You know, the IRS scandal in Benghazi and uh, a host of other things. Um, we have a few minutes left. Um, Mel, anything you want to talk about? I'm trying to I'm trying to pick something, but everything I, everything what I have do you, on what my, you have my list? list of potential topics is, I'm, I'm going to end up uh, rambling on about, which I guess is fine. I can I can. Uh, uh, I mean, the biggest thing I'm following right now is the Caitlin Hunt trial. And tell us about that. 
Um, I think her last name is Hunt. So, Caitlin is a girl from Florida, um, and she, when she was, I think, 17, she was dating this girl that was 14, and, um, they went to the same school, they were on the basketball team together, no problems. As soon as Caitlin turned 18, um, the girlfriend's parents called the police, because the girl technically isn't of the age of consent in Florida, and... I'm surprised Florida has an age of consent. It's, yeah. Little joke there, sorry. And so what they did is the police had Caitlin's girlfriend call Caitlin, and and I personally think this is entrapment. Um, They had the girlfriend call Caitlin and basically talk to her and get her to admit to having intercourse together while the police were listening and of course you know and I read the police report and you can tell this wasn't anything where like Caitlin was being like malicious Mm -hmm. or you know manipulative like they truly loved each other yeah um but as soon as the police heard you know the police reports like oh the the victim and lewd conduct and just like all this like awful language um and so basically, like the Romeo and Juliet law, which is basically for I think people between fourteen and eighteen, you can petition to not have your name on the sex offender list. Mm-hmm. But now Caitlin's facing a felony charge. Um, they gave her a plea deal, which she turned down because it would have had her put her like two years of like psychosexual therapy mm-hmm. and like her name on the sex offender list and. Then he's like, people like, oh, it's just your name on the sex offender list. But it's not just that. Like, you can't go anywhere. Yeah. Nobody will hire you. You're looked at like this terrible person. Right. Um, so now she faces 15 years in prison. Yeah. I, I just, I think it's ridiculous. They're treating wow. her like she's a like a rapist. Right. And she's terrible. And, like, honestly, I think those statutory rape laws shouldn't apply to... You know, it's it's not like I could understand if you know she was like a forty five year old woman and the girl's like fourteen. Right, right. They're, at that age, eighteen, you're still in high school or you're right out of high school. You still have that same mentality that you probably did when you were like fifteen. It's not that much of a difference between the ages. Yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, I can tell you that's not what I want my law enforcement doing is trying to entrap somebody. And I do agree that that's entrapment. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe law enforcement should be used for uh, solving laws. I mean, solving our crimes. I don't uh, don't think we should be wasting our uh, prison space putting 18-year-old girls who happen to be dating somebody younger than them. It was a legit... And people are like, oh, well, she was 14. She she doesn't know how to consent. She can't consent. Like, you know what? When I was 14, like, I I wasn't doing anything, but I'm pretty sure I... I was able to consent. I'm a big believer, and I know a lot of people disagree with this, but I think uh, things like just basic common sense should trump everything, mm. including laws. You know, I mean, yeah, this is silly. It was absolutely entrapment. It's not something the police should be spending their time doing. They should be out solving crimes like rapes and, and murders and robberies. And and now uh, she she might go to prison on a technicality. Yeah, yeah, it's wrong. It's wrong. It, it shouldn't. And and uh, and we only have a couple minutes left, but I, I would assume. Um, that uh, th- there it being a, a lesbian relationship probably has something to do with it. There's a lot of talk about the parents of the girlfriend are like really homophobic, mm-hmm. and yeah. and that's why. And then there are people who are saying like, oh, she just wants special treatment because she's a lesbian, and this happens to eight year old, eighteen year old boys, and nobody cares. But the thing is, like, that if you there's so many cases where this is the same thing has happened, and Nobody cares if an 18-year-old boy is dating a 16-year-old girl, and it's the same mentality. Right. That That's absolutely ridiculous. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, and uh, I, I, I feel badly for her. That's that's terrible. Um, is, she, is she already going to trial? She was supposed to go this past Friday, but I guess they po- postponed it because she wasn't prepared okay. or something. I guess, like... From what I heard, her parents aren't really helping her her case like at all. Uh, I think they're just kind of making it worse okay. for her. Yeah, yeah. So it's I don't I don't know when her trial is now. But right. well, well, maybe something will have progressed with that by by the time we're here next week. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Well, we'll start to wrap up. I do want to remind everybody. Of course, next week my guest right here is Dr. Kevin Ross Emery. So very much looking forward to that. He will be both uh, on this show and on Norman Friends next week as well. Uh, we have a call. Uh, let's just grab this quickly. If 
we have time. Hi, welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed. Who's this? Hey, Matt. It's Brooklyn Mike. How are you? Hey, Brooklyn Mike. Good. How are you? We're actually uh, just about to wrap up. I know. You got like about 30 seconds? Yeah, yeah. Okay. First of all, I want to congratulate you on your show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, hi, Mel. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm um, good, thanks. Uh, real quick, I just want to say, uh, you know, the thing with uh, Glenn, you said that you spoke with him on the phone and he was kind of berating you and yes. he, wanted you to, he wanted you to mention that the person that had called was not him? Yes, yes. Well, how do you know that that was Glenn on the phone <gasps> asking you to oh, make that apology? I didn't even think of wow. that. I didn't even think yeah. of that. Well, you got about an hour to think about that over lunch, and then when you come on to Norm's show, I want you to, you know, address that. Brooklyn Mike, you should be a detective. You're 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 onto something there. I did not even think of that. I, I will. I'm well, gonna I'm gonna think on that. You know, I'm from the big city, so uh, we got to <laughs> think of every angle. You know what I mean? That's right. That's right. I'm with you. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right, you're welcome, and I'll talk to you later. All right, sounds good. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Uh, that was Brooklyn Mike. He's, he's amazing. So um, anyway, so again, Glenn, I'm very sorry. Uh, that'll do it for uh, this week's edition of Matt Connerton Unleashed Television Edition. Don't forget, Saturday night, 11 p.m. Eastern, only on IPMNation.com, the live radio edition. Do you remember who my guest is Saturday? Um, his name's Avni something. You're going international. Oh, okay. Yes, we'll have our first international guest exactly. on the radio edition. So, And if you're watching on MPTS, uh, Inside Story is next, I believe. And I'll be back at 4 with Norm and friends. Mel, thank you very much. You're welcome. No Boundaries Monday nights at 10.30 on IPMNation.com. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you all in a bit. Thanks, everybody.